It is. According to the clock on the wall and my ever-present phone, it is time to get started. And you're thinking, so where's Steve? Okay. It's, uh, it's just me. I'm Paul McNamee, and this is Gail, and we're pinch hitting for Steve and crew. And apparently nobody wanted to get up here with us, so this is it, folks. All right? So we're going to have a, a wonderful time in the house of the Lord this morning. We're so glad that you have come out. I see one gentleman in the audience that is wearing a jacket like me, and I feel so good about that. All right? So if you all will stand with me, and the first one is at Calvary, and I bet you that you know it by heart. All right, here we go. Years I spend in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there's multiplied to Shake hands with somebody in front of you to your left and tell them how glad you are to see them. Turn to your seat, especially the uh, captain. <laughs> so when you ask an, uh, uh, an older person to pick the hymns for the Sunday morning, they're going to be old hymns, right? <laughs> so I know that you know this one. On the first verse of Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no Jesus, 
but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and to trust and obey. Thank you. Now we're going to do something slightly different, okay? It's called call and response. And this is what can wash away my sin. This half of the congregation will, will give the call. You will do the first part. This half will give the answer, all right? Each time we go through each verse, all right? So we're going to, everybody will sing on the chorus, okay? So first part of the verse is, what can wash away my sin? That'll be y'all. And the answer given will be nothing but the blood of Jesus, okay? Here we go. Sing out, all right? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Everyone. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. But the blood of Jesus. All right, this half. This is for my pardon, this I see. And you come back with the response, okay? For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Everyone, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Here we go. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, naught of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, everyone. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all I hope and fee, nothing but the blood of Jesus. On the course, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. We have one more, and I'm going to get y'all, if you would, stand with me. And it's uh, I've got a mansion, okay? On the first verse, here we go. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. A little silver and a little gold, but in 
that city where the ransom will shine. I want a gold one that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. Someday yonder We will never more wander But walk on streets that Are pure as Don't think me poor Or deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, I'll harp and a crown. Sing it. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where. streets that are pure as gold. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for this opportunity to come to your house and worship. Lord, we thank you for Brother Steve and the preparation that goes into his message each Sunday morning. We thank thee for all that you do for us. Pray that you would uh, forgive us where we fail you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what a great day to come together and worship the Lord. And, I, you know, someone asked me one time, uh, do you struggle coming up with, you know, finding things to talk about with the Word? I mean, I've been preaching the Word now about 12 years and actually, the problem is uh, a lot harder than that. It's not that you struggle finding material. It's struggle condensing it down to where, uh, because I look at these scriptures all week, and then the hard part is condensing it down into about a 30-minute message. So there is so much. The Word of God is so deep and so incredible. Now, we have looked at before briefly, and perhaps we'll go into more detail. In Isaiah chapter 63, the first six verses are a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming. And he comes in judgment. We're not going to dwell on those verses today. What we're going to be looking at is the verses after. So we'll be starting in verse 7. Now what you see a lot of times in the prophets, the prophets are giving warnings. They give warnings of judgment. And then usually after that, then there will be kind of a message of mercy that comes with it. And this is that message of mercy that comes after the judgment of the second coming, prophecy of the second coming in the scriptures. I want to tell you ahead of time, the word of God is amazing. And I want you to notice, as we study these verses, we'll be looking at 7 through 11. And we're going to be jumping back and forth to the New Testament because they read like New Testament verses. And it ties everything together so perfectly. Even though these books were written centuries apart, right? They were all penned by the by the Holy Spirit, essentially through people who are writing it down. So by this, by this, I want you to look at that. And I want you to understand how incredible the Word of God is. Maybe you're a person in this room that has a weak faith that really, maybe you would, maybe your friends would call you a lukewarm Christian. You have a weak faith. Well, you can have confidence in the Word of God, and I want to show you that today so that maybe your faith would be made stronger and you can live a more powerful life for the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're an unbeliever, then if you're an unbeliever in this room, also, I want you to consider the Word of God and how incredible the Word of God is, how perfect it is, and how it all fits together. We're going to go all the way from Exodus to 1 Peter with several stops in between. So this could take a while. I'm showing you the difficulty that I have in getting it down to a 30-minute message sometimes. So we may have a recess or a break in the middle. We'll see. 
In, in verse 7, I shall make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindness. Then in verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people. And we're going to pause there for a moment because, yes, Israel is, they are the people of God. They were the people of God. And if they're believers now in Jesus Christ, then they are the people of God now. But because we now are the people of God, you can go ahead and turn to the one I was talking about in 1 Peter. We are the people of God now, but that doesn't mean that God is through with Israel. We know that after the rapture of the church, there is the 70th week, and the 70th week is for the refining of Israel to bring about everlasting righteousness, to bring about the second coming of Jesus Christ and then into the millennial kingdom. So we are not Israel, even though, look at this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So you are now, you are the people of God. So you look back at Isaiah 63, he says, for he said, surely they are my people. Then look what it says, sons who will not deal falsely. I hope that is us also. In other words, children, they are my people. They are my children who will not deal falsely. And I tell you guys, in this world, it's so easy to compromise with the world. You know, it's okay to do it as long as you don't get caught. That's not the case at all, right? Your behavior matters. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about excellent behavior. What may have been a few weeks ago. We should have exceptional behavior because we are followers of Jesus Christ. And right here again, Here in the scriptures, it tells us, we are, surely we are his people, surely they are my people, children, who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. Now that is an amazing statement. And that statement actually is is more literal than some people actually take it. For he became their savior. Now I want to show you that you're very familiar with this, and I can do this verse from memory a lot of times. John chapter 1. You know that? That's New Testament. For those of you who might not know that. John chapter 1, and I'll just go ahead and read it so I don't accidentally leave something out. Listen to this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay, now you're wondering, well, what about this word? And if you know the scripture very well, you know that the word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. So now let's make sure that you understand that. Let's go to skip to verse 14. Look at what it says in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word has always existed. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is John speaking. So who is this? The Word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who it is. Now go back to Isaiah 63 and look at what it says. So he became their Savior. Do you see that? The more literal it's, it's almost like New Testament verses right here in the book of Isaiah. And that's why oftentimes I call it the gospel of Isaiah because it just speaks so much <clears throat> about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 9 it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted. Now I want to show you another verse because God knows and he cares about your afflictions. I don't know what you're going through today or what difficulties you're experiencing, but God knows and he cares. So I want to show you that in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and we'll start in the 31st verse. Now, this is talking about the second coming of Jesus. After the second coming, when he judges the unbelievers and the believers. Okay, but in this verse, you'll see the point that I'm trying to make here about he cares. Sometimes it's easy in this world to lose faith or walk in weak faith or not understand that he cares and he knows. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. 
Look at this, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you, are, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, I'm skipping the next verses, but the, the ones that are on his right, the sheep say, well, when did we do those things for you? Okay, now, moving down to verse 40. The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You see what that means? That means that he associates himself with your difficulties. You see, he cares. He cares what you're going through. And he never promised us that this life would be easy. In fact, in this life, he said, you'll have troubles in this life. But he promises never to leave us or forsake us. He promises, and he promises us here in this verse that he knows what you're going through. He knows the difficulties in your life and the problems. He knows the blessings. He knows it all. And guys, if he doesn't remove the obstacle or the difficulty for you here, he's certainly going to do it there. We're promised a resurrection like his. But he knows. He knows. And he associates your hunger with his hunger. He associates his imprisonment with your imprisonment. Do you see that? Whatever difficulties, he sees it as his own. Now, continuing in verse 9, after the affliction, in verse 9 it says, and the angel of his presence saved them. Now, we're not sure at this point what this is talking about, but I'll tell you ahead of time, the angel of his presence is going to be, and we'll see this, the angel of the Lord. Now, we know the angel of the Lord is also the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll show you that too because we're going to go back to the verses and look at it. But at this point, we're not talking about, so he became their Savior. What is this exactly talking about? Is this talking about a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ? Most certainly. But is this also talking about some historical event? I believe so, and I will show you. So the angel of his presence, we will see, and we're going to study this quite a bit today. We'll look at that, and that is the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then look, in his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them and carried them all the days of old. So this is talking about something kind of in the past. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Now, have you ever heard somebody say that the Trinity is not in the Old Testament? Have you ever heard somebody say that? In fact, many Muslims, that's their objection to the New Testament, is because the Old Testament doesn't show the Trinity. Well, if you've been paying attention or maybe you passed over it, I'll just point it out to you. Right here in these three verses, 8 through 10, the Trinity is mentioned. First of all, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their Savior. And I told you that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He became their Savior, the only begotten Son of God. So now you have the Father and the Son. And then look in verse 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So there's the Trinity right there in three verses in the Old Testament. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Do you know also in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4, it says that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? I mean, do you care if you have a loved one, do you care when you hurt them? Does it bother you that when you hurt them? Now think of this. God, he saved you. Jesus saved you, right? And he loves you. He cares about you. And then we grieve the Holy Spirit when we rebel against them or not do what we're supposed to do. Think about that. We should care about grieving the Holy Spirit. All right. So now, we're going to be moving farther back into the Old Testament, and we're going to be looking at this. Now, look. Oh, I forgot. This is a very important point. In verse 11, Then his people remembered the days of old of Moses, whereas he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock... So now, if you look at this, these verses, this is to the future. It's looking at Christ Jesus, but it's also looking backwards. And what's it looking backward at? The days of Moses. So the angel of his presence saved them. Well, what do you think that has to do when you look at Moses? Well, it has to do with the Exodus. So now the Exodus also points to Christ symbolically in many ways. Right? You remember the Passover lamb? Who is the Passover lamb? How was their firstborn saved? By the blood of the lamb on the lintel of their door. 
right? What about the manna that came down from heaven in the wilderness? Jesus says, I am that manna. Not, he wasn't literally the manna. It's symbolic of who he is. He is the bread that came down out of heaven. Remember the rock, right? The rock that was struck for water to come out, and it was supposed to be struck once, and then after that, you speak to the rock to get the water out. That's Jesus Christ. And then also the living water. They were thirsty, and they needed water. What about the serpent on a stick? The people had sinned, and so serpents, poisonous vipers, or whatever were in the camp, and they would get bitten. And so God told Moses to put a bronze serpent, make a bronze serpent, and put it on a stick, which seems like idolatry to me, but it really wasn't. It was symbolism for Jesus Christ. How was it symbolism? Jesus became sin on the cross when he took our sin. And if the people would look to the serpent on the stick, they would be healed from the bite of the serpents. Do you see it? Many things in the Exodus are symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you, Jesus Christ was there. It wasn't just symbolism. I'm going to show you from the start to entering the promised land, Jesus Christ was there. So now to look at that, let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. I told you we're all over the place today, but it's good. This is too good not to, not to look at it all. Yeah, we're doing all right with time. I think we'll make it before lunch. Exodus chapter 3. So now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb and the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the blazing fire from the midst of a bush. Okay, so now who is in the burning bush? The angel of the Lord. Now you know where I'm going with this, but this makes it perfectly clear. So the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush. So, let's see. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush. Now, who's in the bush? The angel of the Lord, God, right? This is the angel of his presence. Over and over, we see the same thing. The angel of the Lord is God. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so Moses is going along, minding his own business, watching his flock, and he sees this amazing sight, and he turns to look at it, right? And then as soon as he does, the Lord calls him over, right? Sounds more like entrapment, right? So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, surely, listen to this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Do you see it again? He knows. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. I could have just said to the place of all the sites, right? <laughs> now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Listen to this, verse 10. Therefore, come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So the first thing we see, the angel of his presence, the angel of God, the first thing we see him do is calling. He's calling out Moses to call the people out of bondage. That's what he's doing. Because the people are in slavery in Egypt, and he's calling Moses to go to Pharaoh, let my people go. You've seen Charleston Heston say that over and over. Let my people go in the old movie. Young people are going, who is that? Okay, the next one. Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 17. 
Now, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry, you shall take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Then they set out from Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Now listen to this, verse 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So now, they're out of bondage, so to speak. They're out of slavery. And now you have the Lord leading them. And well, you say, well, this isn't the angel of the Lord. Well, I'll show you. Just be patient. We'll get there in the next one, right? He is leading them now in the wilderness of sin. He is leading them by day and by night, always, always there with them, never forsaking or leaving them, leading them in the wilderness of sin. So now moving over to 14, chapter 14, verse 19. And by the way, in this wilderness of sin, they had all kinds of discomfort, thirst, hunger, difficulty. Like I said, snakes. They had all kinds of problems. They rebelled against the Lord and they suffered the consequences. It was not easy. It was extremely difficult. In fact, many times they cried out and said, we should just go back to Egypt. It was easier being slaves in Egypt than it is to be here in this wilderness of sin. But God was leading them the whole way and was always there with them. Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 19. This is, this is where I'm telling you, look at this. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. So this, this, this pillar of cloud by day and this pillar of, pillar of fire by night that's been leading them in the wilderness of sin all this time, this is the angel of God, the angel of his presence. The same one that said, I am God, basically in the burning bush. He said, I am God. So the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. So what has happened is they're on the edge of the Red Sea, before the Red Sea crossing. And here comes Pharaoh's army, right? Now these people, God already said they're not fit for war. They're probably going to get scared, want to go back to Egypt. But now here comes Pharaoh. And they're completely vulnerable. They don't have weapons of war. They haven't been trained in weapons of war. They've been making bricks and doing things of that nature. And here comes Pharaoh's army right up on them, all the chariots and everything. And what does the angel of the Lord do? The angel of the Lord goes around behind them now and blocks off Egypt, the warriors of Egypt, Pharaoh's army, away from them. to where you can't get to them. So you see now also what the Lord does here? He's protecting them where they're most vulnerable. Otherwise, they would be completely overwhelmed. They could not handle the attack of the enemy without the Lord protecting them. And this also is the same pillar of fire at night, pillar of cloud during the day. This is the angel of God, this is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to my favorite, Exodus chapter 23. This one is less well known. Maybe you didn't realize that this was one of them. You have to pay close attention to see it sometimes. Okay, now this is before they enter the promised land. Okay, they've been wandering around the wilderness now, and they're going to enter the promised land. Look, look what God says, behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Listen to verse 21. Be on your guard before him. Obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression. All right, I'm going to pause there. Who can forgive sins? God. God's the only one that can forgive sins. So what, is it, what about this angel? It says that 
If you're rebellious against him, he will not forgive your sins. So this, is, this angel is the angel of God again. This is God Almighty, the same God in the burning bush, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar that went behind them and protected them from their enemies on their flank. This is the same one. With all the symbolism is about Jesus Christ that we talked about with the Exodus. And the Old Testament points so beautifully and perfectly to the Lord Jesus Christ and helps us understand the New Testament. And the New Testament fulfills many things that the Old Testament said. It's wonderful how it fits together like a perfect puzzle. Look at this. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not re be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression. Now, this is a strange thing to say if you don't understand what's going on. Look, since my name is in him. He didn't say, I gave him a name. I put my name on him. It says, my name is in him. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so, but if you, let's see, where? Yeah, 22. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. So now you see here, I love the beginning part of this verse because it said he's going to take you, he's going to guide you. But he's already been guiding them. He's been there with them 24 hours a day in the wilderness of sin. But now he's going to take them to the promised land. In incredible vision of what happened back then. But guys, that's not all. We know now that we are the people of God. We know that this is Jesus Christ, and this all points to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you the same thing is happening now in the kingdom of God with us. Jesus is doing the very same things. Guys, behold, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your Jesus. This is your Jesus that did this in the Exodus. And I'm telling you right now, he's still doing it for you right now. And I want to show you the verses. You are the people of God. God cares for you. Back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember, the people in the Exodus, they are in bondage. And God called Moses, and Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he said, I'm going to send a, a prophet unto, like Moses is coming unto you, and you should listen and obey his voice. Well, that prophet, why is Jesus like unto Moses? Well, think about what Moses did. Moses was called by God. He was just a prophet, but he called the people out of bondage. Now, what did Christ do for us? Look at this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So in the same way, Jesus, Moses was symbolism for Jesus Christ in the Exodus. And all the Exodus is symbolism about Jesus Christ. And Jesus was also there. But now the first thing that Moses was called to do, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Well, that is what Christ has done for you. See, you were in bondage. You were a slave to sin before you knew Christ. There was no way you could free yourself. But when the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. So the first thing he does when you came by faith to Jesus Christ is he sets you free. Now we are bond servants to the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are no longer a slave to sin. So we have been set free. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the first thing that happened. That's the first thing that the angel of his presence did at the Exodus, representing salvation. Okay, well, let's look at the next one. I'm going to turn now to John chapter 10. The next thing that happened was the angel of the Lord led them by day and by night. Now, Jesus Christ refers to him as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and indeed, really, he is the only shepherd. John chapter 10, starting in verse 22. There were many verses I could have gone to with this one. I just picked this one. I thought this fit really well. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Guys, he's already told them over and over. And when he, when he told them, they would pick up stones to kill him. 
He's already said it many times. They just don't want to believe it. And guys, it always comes down to that. If you're an unbeliever in this room, don't wait to be convinced. It's not a condition of your mind that makes you a believer. It is a decision of your will. It's a volitional act of your will to believe. I've said this before. You know, if you were to come down to the altar today and, and I would pray with you and talk to you about salvation of the Lord, when are you actually saved? It's an act of your own will. When you say the prayer, when you made the decision to stand up and come forward or stay in your seat when you made the decision to follow Christ, that's when you're saved. And see, that sets you free from bondage. That's what Christ did for you. He's calling you right now out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't wait another day. Moody used to tell people, are you, ask them, are you a Christian? If they said, no, you must become one right away, he would say. And yes, it is that important. Become a Christian right away. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. What more does he have to do? These people have seen way more than we have seen. He's done all these healings and acts and all raising people from the dead, and they still won't believe. But you know what he said about you and me? He said, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. Blessed are you. You are the people of God. He loves you. He cares about you. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, now, in Exodus chapter 13, remember what he does, the pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. He's leading them and guiding them through the wilderness of sin, which, guys, if you didn't know, that is a representation right now of where we are. And remember, the wilderness of sin, it's difficult. It's messy. People died. People were hungry. People were thirsty. People were scared, but he's always there leading them by day and leading them by night. Look at this. I told you, and you don't believe, now verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now remember, you're the people of God, and he is the great shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now I, wanna, I didn't plan on using this verse, but I'm going to look at, look at verse 11 going backwards. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So you know who this is, and you know who you are. Look at this. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So now remember, he's leading us. Just like in the Exodus with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud in the day, he's leading them through the wilderness of sin. And guys, we are to be led by the good shepherd. Follow the good shepherd. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Go after him. Follow Jesus Christ. So just like in the Exodus, with the appearance of the angel of his presence, what did he do? First, he called them out of darkness into marvelous light. He called them out of slavery. Now they're in the wilderness of sin, and he's there with them, never leaving them, forsaking them, always following them, leading them wherever they go, and they follow him. Okay, now what is the next thing that happened that the angel of his presence did in Exodus chapter 14? Remember, he went around to their back and protected them when they were most vulnerable. He protected them when they could not withstand the attack of the enemy themselves. Well, guys, guess what? That's exactly what he's doing for you right now. Now, I'll read uh, 28, and 28 through 30. And I give eternal life to them, speaking of the sheep. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Okay, now this, this last verse 30 is for the people he's told over and over and over, and they don't believe it, right? I and the Father are one. Okay, what do they do? They pick up rocks to stone him. Tell us plainly if you're the Christ. I'm the Christ. All right, we'll throw rocks at you, right? But anyway, shouldn't you believe the miracles that he did? Would God allow someone like this to perform miracles and raise the dead? and then speak blasphemy, maybe they should consider what he has to say. So now he calls us out of darkness, right? Just like the angel of his presence did in the Exodus. He leads us 24 hours a day, day and night, just like in the Exodus, and then he protects us. So he protects us. No one can snatch us out of his hand. And that's good news. Like if you were a believer in Jesus Christ, you are kept in the very hand of God, and nothing is going to take that away from you. But see, there's even more. Remember, the people recognized, 
without the, they should have recognized, without the Lord, we are very vulnerable and we could die because we could be overwhelmed by the enemy. Remember Pharaoh's army coming? And then the angel of God went around the back and protected them? But guys, look, without God, you would be completely overwhelmed by the enemy. And you know, there's a scripture, it says, he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our ability to resist. Do you see what that means? He's protecting you, and he will not allow the enemy to overwhelm you. So just like in the Exodus, what the angel of the Lord was doing back then with the people of God, he is doing now for the people of God, his sheep, you. And my favorite, Remember in the last one, Exodus chapter 23, said he's going to guide them to a place that was prepared for them. And guys, this is the promised land. Now turn just a few pages over to John chapter 14. We probably don't even have to turn there. We can quote this for memory. Jesus is telling the disciples here, and this is words for you also, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Do you remember what it said in Isaiah? Look, at, I'll just, I'll bring this back up here. Look at this. No, it was Exodus. Exodus chapter 23. If you're tired of turning, I'll just read it for you. Exodus 23 and verse 20. Listen to what it says. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Isn't that amazing how close that is? In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going, and you know what Thomas says here. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Give us a map, GPS, iPhone, something. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You remember at the battle of Jericho when the commander of the Lord of hosts, which is Jesus Christ, appeared to Joshua and gave him the instructions for conquering Jericho which are really silly instructions, not a very smart military plan, but not for God. God was testing their faith. So they did exactly what God said, and the walls fell, and they took Jericho, right? Well, remember that. See, now he said, I, I go to prepare a place for you. And what did he say about the promised land? Go into the place that I have prepared for you. See, that's a picture of us going home. See, this, did you know that this is not our home? In many ways, it's difficult and we have blessings, but at the same time, this is not our home. He's preparing a place for us. You are the people of God. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He leads you. He leads you and guides you in the middle of the wilderness of sin. He protects you from your vulnerabilities, doesn't allow you to be overwhelmed by the enemy. And guys, he's preparing a place for you so that he will take us home so that we can be where he is because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. So guys, what do we do with this information? I told you the word of God is incredible. It's just mind-blowing how perfect it is from the beginning to the end. God is awesome. Have faith. Live by faith, not by fear. In this world in which we live in, don't be fearful. Be brave, courageous. Trust in the Lord. He leads you. He's got your flank. He's already saved you, and he is going to take you home. That's what the Exodus says, pointing also to Christ in the New Testament, and that's what the New Testament verifies exactly like it. So now, unbelievers, come to Christ. Give your life to Jesus. Don't wait another day. You could get hit by some crazy driver in our own parking lot and not make it. <laughs> Trust in the Lord. It's the best decision you'll ever make. And guys, for us, look at what Christ has done, is doing, and will do for us. Remember he said, surely they are my people, sons. 
surely they will obey my voice. We have an incredible responsibility to have exceptional behavior. Love the people of God. Trust Jesus. Reach out to the lost. And guys, in the end, he's coming for us, and he'll take us home. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for the Old Testament scriptures that kind of, they're so symbolic of Jesus Christ and point to him. They're symbolic and also stories of what he actually did and how that fits so perfectly and beautifully with the New Testament. It gives us incredible confidence in the word of God and incredible faith so that we can live bold lives in the name of Jesus. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. God, thank you that Jesus leads us every which way as we wander and go about in the wilderness of sin. God, thank you for giving us a purpose in this mess of a world. Thank you for leading us 24 hours a day and never leaving us or forsaking us. God, thank you for protecting our vulnerabilities, not allowing us to be overwhelmed by the enemy. And God, we thank you again, even looking forward to the future when we go to the place that you have prepared for us, the promised land in victory. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.